Well, many thanks for joining us. You're watching QTV Broadcasting from The Gambia, and this is the news with me, Antoine Eswanyasi. Our headlines. President Barrow has presided over the swearing of C.D. Keita, the new Minister of Trade and Employment. The Minister of Finance on Thursday tabled before Parliament the 2021 revenue and expenditure estimate after the newly elected member of Parliament for Nyamina West, Biram Sow, took his oath of office. The Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources on Thursday validated the strategic program for climate resilience to address and enable the government to apply for funding for the project. The TRRC continues to hear testimonies of victims who suffered illegal arrest, detention and torture at the hands of the now defunct NIA. In international news, the former president of Ghana, Jerry John Rawlings, has died at the age of 73 after suffering from a brief illness. In sports news, the African Nations Cup was due to have kicked off and concluded this weekend, but it has been postponed. However, the competition is not taking place where one might expect. Well, those were our main headlines and now the news in detail. President Barrow has acknowledged the private sector as the engine of economic growth as he urges Gambians to explore the business environment in the country for the progress and development of the country. He made this call on Thursday as he presided over the swearing-in of Sidi Keita, the new Minister of Trade and Employment. Alucisia reports. The new Minister for Trade, Industry, Regional Integration and Employment, Mr. Sidi Keita, holds a double master's in business administration and financial management. Until his ministerial appointment, Keita served as director of the finance department at the Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector in Geta from 2011. Back home, Mr. Keita worked at the Accountant General's Department and the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority, where he held various positions to the level of chief accountant before he left for a World Bank funded health project in 1998. President Barrow, while welcoming the new minister, says Keita's appointment is prompted by his experience and hard work, both nationally and internationally which he believes will help in transforming the trade sector. The president is hopeful that Keita's expertise will further enrich policy and decision making at both cabinet and ministerial level for the advancement of the country. I am confident that the appointment of Honorable Keita will add value to the great work that has been going on to enhance trade and industrial development, as well as creating employment and promoting regional integration for economic growth. The tax at hand is not an easy one. But it is expected that working with his team and all relevant stakeholders and partners, he will assume leadership to guide the sector to steer economic growth with active private sector engagement. He stressed his government's commitment to engage in institutional and legal reforms and respect for the principles and ideals of the Constitution and the National Development Plan. Future generations will judge us. Therefore, by how much we have risen to the nation's challenges and expectations, by how far we will go in moving the development agenda of the country, and most importantly, by the extent of our success in fulfilling the aspirations of the people who have reposed their faith in us. President Barrow used the occasion to thank Keita's predecessor, Lamin Job, for his service to the nation while wishing him all the best in his next engagement. According to the President, Job is now redeployed to the Foreign Service. I call on all Gambian citizens to exploit the business environment in the country and make good use of it so that together we can achieve our noble goals. Let us acknowledge the private sector as the engine of economic growth. The president again preached unity, saying, let our diversity be a source of strength and cooperation for closer relationship. After taking the oath of office, allegiance and secrecy, Minister C.D. Keita says he is humbled by the trust and confidence bestowed on him to serve the government and the Gambia at large, saying he looks forward to working with his cabinet colleagues in the true spirit of collective responsibility to advance the cause of national development. My decision to accept this role was only arrived at after deep reflection as it required a lot of personal sacrifice and its premise on the opportunity this role will enable me to serve my country in a position of responsibility 
that can support my desire to positively impact the life of the, my fellow Gambians. I deem it a civic duty to partake in the development of my country and hence the consideration of the common good for the Gambia override my personal interests. I take this opportunity to call on fellow Gambians to participate in national development as the development of the Gambia is the business of every Gambian. Among Keta's main challenges is to address the unemployment rate in the country and to further enhance trade within and between the country and outsiders. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sise. The Minister of Finance on Thursday tabled the 2021 Revenue and Expenditure Estimate before Parliament. Earlier, the newly elected member of Parliament for Nyamina West, Biram Sow, took his oath of office. More in this report. Seeking parliamentary review and approval for a total appropriation exceeding $22.2 billion, the Minister of Finance, Mamurin Jai, went to the table before Parliament the 2021 revenue and expenditure estimates expected to exceed $30 billion. He says COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the economy as the country registered a considerable decline in revenue growth and all expenditures significantly increased. Indeed, our contemporary socio-economic landscape and as we formulate this 2021 budget, COVID-19 has emerged as the single most important parameter and direct to our development Ideas the National Debt Service is unsurprisingly the highest allocated budget entity with almost $6 billion, followed by the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education with $2.8 billion. Meanwhile, the minister says infrastructural development is being seriously considered in the 2021 budget, revealing that most of the roads projects to be implemented in 2021 will be financed from government funds. Furthermore, $1.99 billion has been allocated for centralized services, while $1.62 billion has been allocated for the Ministry of Transport, and $13.7 billion is expected to be raised from taxes and non-tax revenues. While the deficit has increased to $6.1 billion, up from $3.8 billion in 2020, Parliament is expected to commence sessions on the 2021 budget when MPs reconvene on Monday, November 16th. Earlier, newly elected National Assembly member for Nyamina West Biram Sow took his oath of office in a moment symbolizing the dawn of a new era in his new political life. Honorable Sow took to the floor of the chamber as he was led through the traditional oath of office by the clerk of the assembly. I shall be faithful and be a true allegiance and be a true allegiance to the Republic of the Gambia to the Republic of the Gambia as by law established as by law established that I shall that I shall execute, execute the functions of member, the functions of member of the National Assembly, of the National Assembly, without fear or favor, without fear or favor, affection or Aff ill will, affection or ill will, according to the Constitution, according to the Constitution, and other laws of the Gambia, and other laws of the Gambia. So help me God. So yeah. help me out. Honorable Biram So, who replaces the late Honorable So, says his immediate priority is to unite the people of Nyamina. Antoine Soinyasi for KTV News. The Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources on Thursday validated the strategic program for climate resilience to address and enable the government to apply for funding for the project to help achieve the necessary climate and development goals. Ajibintu Drame reports. In 2017, the Environment Ministry devised a strategic program for climate resilience with support from the World Bank's Climate Investment Funds. The program is a 25-year strategic investment plan focusing on building resilience on the impacts of climate change by supporting adaptation and mitigation across all the sectors of the country. The Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Environment, Climate and Natural Resources, Mumudumbai Jabang says, Gambia is among the most vulnerable countries in Africa to the impacts of climate change due to the low-lying nature of the country's coastal line. He further implores all stakeholders and individuals to work together to make it a success as the proposal is essential to the environment and natural resource sector. Impacts of climate change on our communities and their livelihoods as well as the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather events expose many urban and rural settlements to a wide range of risks. They are often ill-equipped to handle. The project coordinator for action against desertification at the FAO, Abdullah Danso, hopes that the project 
what's validated will actually be realized. We have to make things different here. With this amount of money that is being said about uh, this particular proposal, we must also ensure that, I mean, there is a system in place. And that's the more reason why I was talking of the coordination of this project. So that there will be an institution responsible solely to ensure that the project implementation is being coordinated and not to have the same institution coordinating and implementing because you cannot be the judge and the jury. That being the case, that there would be a, co a conflict of interest. Alpha A.K. Jalo, National Focal Point for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, explains what he sees as the challenges and also the repercussions if the issue of climate change is not addressed. Issues of climate change, the negativity of climate change will, will, will exacerbate, will increase. And then you have seen what we have noticed now, higher temperatures. You, we, all, we are all crying, crying that it is hot, it is hot. That's going to increase. And then uh, for the rainy season, it, it will be much more, the pattern will not be the same. It will alternate between drought, between erratic, between inadequate and excessive rains. The main challenge is accessing funds. If, because doing all these things, we need funds, we need projects. Okay, it is. We acknowledge that we have received funding for certain projects on adaptation, and very few projects on mitigation. But we need funds to at least to implement these programs that we are validating today. The concept no driving the program was developed into a full proposal of five components, with the first focusing on policy, legislative, and institutional review and development. The challenge after validation will be implementation. Ajibinto Dwame, QTV News. The TRRC continues to hear testimonies of victims who suffered illegal arrest, detention and torture at the hands of the now defunct NIA. Two witnesses on Wednesday narrated how they were arrested, detained and severely beaten and how those beatings led to the death of some people arrested in 1995 and 2016. Babu Garcia has the rest of that story. The first witness, Modu Ture, told the commission that he was among the UDP militants arrested by state security agents on 14 April 2016 when they protested at Westfield for electoral reforms. He said they were arrested by PIU officers and later transported to the Mile 2 Central Prison Security Wing with 26 orders. The witness said the NIA officers came for them late at night and took them to a dark house near the State House building where they face a panel of interrogators before going through some serious torture. Push and pull, and and there was a push and pull, they hit me on my neck. No, joints will be further. And at the time when all my joints went limp, yeah. they made me to lie down. Yeah. They tied my chest to the table. And because city men now. With my hands, because what they tied me up with, it looked like if it is something which had electricity in it. Victor, I became very weak. And they came and stood over me. And they were beating me. They beat me up to a point. Almost five minutes. Almost after five minutes, they will pour some water on me. The witness said he endured severe beatings at the hands of the NIA that he now easily forget things. He said they were taken back to the mile two prisons and 25 people were packed in a single cell. After a while, the witness said they were transferred to the Janjambura prison where they were made to travel in order to attend court cases in Banjul. After many court cases, they were sentenced to three years in prison. Modu Ture said they spent eight months and four days in Janjambura and were transferred to the mile two central prison where they stayed until Jame was voted out in 2016. Next to appear before the commission was Omar Ba, who also told the commission that he was a victim of the NIA. According to him, he was among those that left their homes to partake in the 1995 planned protests in front of the American embassy, only to be picked up by men in plain clothes who had been acting as if they were in the same protest group. The witness said they were arrested and taken to the Kairaba police station and later transferred to Fajara barracks. He said more than 40 people were arrested and kept at the barracks and they went through a lot of hardship at the hands of the security agents. If I can remember properly, in fact before they asked anybody, they came amongst us and started beating us seriously. 
was this when Alma Momane came with a group of soldiers? When you get out of the Alma Momane, you were soldier Kafu Naraba. Yes, that was the day. The witness said some of the arrested people could not survive having undergone serious torture, sustaining wounds all over their bodies. After months at the Fajara barracks, Mr. Ba said they were taken to court and charged with sedition. He said the case lasted many months with uncountable adjournments before they were bailed. But according to him, it was announced over the radio the same day they were bailed that the bail had been revoked and they had to report back to the Fajara barracks. The witness recalled the names of the agents who tortured them. And in for everybody. And for everybody. And in Sukuta Jammi. And Sukuta Jammi. And in Bamba Mane. And Bamba Mane. And, uh, and in Demba Sise. And Demba Sise. Demba Sise be more than a minute to arrest me at home. Demba Sise was one of those people who came to arrest me at home. Omar Ba said he has been arrested and bailed on more than five occasions. And each time he was arrested, he would either be tortured or electrocuted by the members of the NIA. He told the commission that he has been feeling pain since the forced torture in 1995 up till now. Babu Karsi, QTV News. From the report, we take a short commercial break, but when we come back, the news continues with some more local news. Do stay tuned. Well, thanks for staying with us. China's embassy in the Gambia on Thursday donated sanitary items worth thousands of dollars to the Kanifeng Municipal Council as part of efforts to curb the spread of COVID-19, especially in schools. More in this report. The sanitary items include hand-washing buckets, locally made reusable face masks, and bottles of hand sanitizers, amongst other things. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19, Close to 3,000 people have been infected in the Gambia, prompting swift action by authorities to lay down strict measures. After emergency restrictions were eased, schools resumed in October. However, preventive measures such as regular hand washing, wearing of face masks and social distancing are still in place. China's ambassador to the Gambia, Ma Jianchun, says their support is prompted by the shortage of health equipment a challenge expressed by the KMC. Adequate efforts are needed to protect the hard-won achievements made in the Gambia fight against the COVID-19 in the past months. And the necessary precautionary measures need to be taken to ensure that school children are in safe and health learning environments when they go back to the schools. The Carnival Municipal Council is a densely populated area with close to half a million people and many schools. These materials could help in preventing the further spread of the virus in schools. The KMC mayor, Talib Ahmed Ben Suda, hailed the efforts of the Chinese embassy. These equipment today will be part of our pillar two of our COVID response, which is to stop the spread. And sanitation equipment such as these will prevent the spread of the virus even further. And it is so timely, especially that schools have reopened and children who uh, we might say could be super spreaders because they go in densely populated schools and go back to their communities are obviously uh, 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 people that we really need to protect. The coronavirus pandemic has caused havoc around the world, including the Gambia with massive loss of lives and economic damage. With the second wave of the virus hitting several countries, the Gambia should be on alert to prevent a second wave. As such, this donation is a most welcome one. Umudu Gajaga, QTV News. A Guinean national on Thursday told the Truth Commission that he was arrested by the NIA in 2015, accused of being involved in illegal business dealings and tortured several times before the NIA, went to his house and stole his properties and a hundred thousand dollars. Babukarsi reports. Guinean national Amadou Jogoso, a businessman, was the first to appear before the commission to narrate his ordeal at the hands of the NIA. 
He told the commission that he came to the country in 1993 and lived in Bundung, trading in colonel and eggs. He said in 2015, he was involved in a gold dust business and money doubling with a friend called Abbas. The witness admitted that the work he and his friend were doing, which led to his arrest by the NIA, was illegal. The NIA asked him to locate his friends involved in the illegal act, but he told them that he could not locate them, which led to him being tortured. On say be be jetti duma handcuff je dem be be handcuff illa baw. And that was the time they handcuffed my hands behind me. They put the banta de la. And they started beating me. The pila ndong ha, the pila ha. Be yo min joni hand de war to la mai mi holla on kawuri hodi lo. The beating was so hard that I told them, okay, don't stop the beating. Then I will show you where Wuri is. He said he went through different types of torture and fainted more than three times before the NIA escorted him to his house and conducted a search and took away important items, including phones and a safe containing hundred thousand dollars. He said he was kept at the NIA for six months before he was transferred to the Maitu Central Prisons, where he was detained without trial or access to his family for eight months before he was taken to court, where a judge acquitted and discharged him. He said the materials and hundred thousand dollars taken in his room were never returned to him. His testimony was followed by that of Sidi Sane of Jara Sankuya. Mr. Sane recalled an incident in 1995 when he and two of his friends went to Senegal to attend a naming ceremony. On their return to the Gambia, he was arrested and taken to Mansa Congo Police Station and later to the Serious Crime Unit before being handed over to the NIA where he said Daba Marena led a team of torturers who electrocuted him. The man who said bring him, his name is Daba Marena. At that time they said he was the man responsible for that area. Operation. And it was the place called Operations. The witness said he was kept at the NIA for three months and later transferred to the Fajara barracks where he found more than 40 people, including political detainees. A father to seven kids taking care of his mom and dad. The witness said his arrest and detention caused a lot of disruption for him and his family as they struggled to survive whilst he continued to struggle with his health up to now. He ended his testimony by calling on the government to arrest those who are found wanting for their actions during the 22 years of Jamis regime and also urge them to close down the NIA. NIA headquarters. The NIA headquarters. That should be completely banned. The name NIA should not be named in this country again. I don't know because I see it on TV. People saying it's the smiling coast. But this country is not a smiling coast. Babu Karsi. QTV News. A floating bridge worth three hundred thousand dollars was launched on Wednesday at the Banjul terminal for easy access to boat to boats rather crossing from Banjul to Bara. This comes after the ferry services were suspended for one month due to improvement works. Loliam Kamara tells us more. The pontoon or floating bridge was installed by the Gambia Maritime Administration in collaboration with the Gambia Ports Authority. The aim is to provide safety for passengers who would otherwise get wet or have to pay porters to lift them into the boats or to the shore while embarking or disembarking. The maritime officials believe that the availability of the floating bridge will also provide security for passengers and eliminate criminal activities that used to occur. At the launch, the Public Relations Officer of the Gambia Maritime Administration, Ibrahim Abba, attaches great importance to the initiative, indicating that the floating bridge will help in the safe movement of passengers and the facility is here to stay, even if the ferry resumes operation. We have seen that this pontoon has greatly improved the situation here with regards to transporting passengers. We are thinking of improving the project at the bar end, because as at now, it is only at the banyul end that we have this pontoon installed. We want the public to understand that this pontoon will stay even if the ferry service resumes work. The deputy director of Hub Books at the Gambia Ports Authority, Ma'am Pate Danfa, says the installation of the floating bridge will prevent passengers from paying money to be carried by porters. 
passengers will no longer be paying for their disembarkation or embarkation, as well as that accidents of falling into the water will be greatly minimized. So this was the idea behind why GPA came uh, into partnership with DMA. I will also emphasize that we need to take good use of this equipment, especially when it comes to the maintenance. Buba Sise, a porter who earns a living lifting passengers to and from the boat's France at the initiative, saying it has posed a big challenge to their only source of income. What they want now is for us to go and steal or rob people. If we do that, they take us to police or mile two. This is the only place we earn a decent living. They should allow us to work. Abbas Saidikan, a maritime surveyor, said a dialogue has been conducted, but the porters are not happy with the suggestion put to them. I told them there could be a way to solve this. One is, you come to our office, we have a meeting, and then you can suggest this to our management. That is, we hand over the pontoon to you, and then you charge the passengers by $5, so that at the end of the day, you know the number of people there, and you can distribute, everybody can be happy, or have something to go home with. But they are not happy with that because they think five dollars is small. As they load people on board is about uh, ten dollars. Twenty, okay. So now they said no. We want this it this way that people going can embark by themselves on the pontoon and to go to the canoes. And when the people coming from Bara are coming, we can disembark them. But this will compromise the safety we are trying to implement here. Funejame, a community, has this to say. It is helpful because there will be no carrying of passengers. We thank God and pray for it to last long. Gambia Maritime Administration designed the pontoon or floating boat to enable passengers to embark and disembark the canoes without having to be carried by porters. This will increase security and will help passengers save money as well. For QTV News, Loli M. Kamara. Well, we now take our second commercial break, but still to come is international and sports news. Welcome back. Over now to international news. And we begin with some sad news. The former president of Ghana, Jerry John Rawlings, has died at the age of 73 after suffering from a brief illness. Here is the report. Official confirmation of the death of Jerry Rawlings came from the office of Ghana's president. Prior to this, the news had been circulating on social media. The message from the president's office says, and I quote, It is with great sadness that I announced to the nation that the first president of the Fourth Republic, His Excellency Jerry John Rawlings, has joined the ancestors, end of quote. According to state-owned Daily Graphic, the former president had been admitted at Kolebo Teaching Hospital for about a week for an undisclosed ailment. He was 73. His death comes a matter of weeks after Rawlings passed away. Jerry John Rawlings was born in Accra on 22nd June 1947 to a Ghanaian mother from a town in the Volta region and a Scottish father. On leaving school, he soon after enlisted as a flight cadet in the Ghana Air Force in August 1967 and was subsequently selected for officer cadet training at the Ghana Military Academy and Training School, Tashi, in Accra. He was 20 years old. In March 1968, he was posted to Takoradi in the western region to continue his course. Passed out in January 1969 as a commissioned pilot officer. He won the coveted Speed Bad Trophy as the best cadet in flying and airmanship. Rawlings was eventually promoted to the rank of flight lieutenant in April 1978. In interviews later, Rawlings said that during his service with the Ghana Air Force, he witnessed the deterioration of discipline and morale reflecting the corruption of the regime of the Supreme Military Council at that time. He also claimed that as he rose through the ranks, he came into contact with the privileged classes and their social values, and that his awareness of the injustices in society became sharpened. 
On May 28, 1979, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, together with six others, appeared before a general court martial in Accra, charged with leading a mutiny of junior officers and men of the Ghana Armed Forces on 15 May 1979. There was strong public reaction, especially after his statement had been read in court, explaining the social injustices that had prompted him to act. The ranks of the armed forces in particular expressed deep sympathy with his stated aims. When he was scheduled for another court appearance on 4th June 1979, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings was sprung from custody. With the support of both military and civilians, he led a revolt, ousting the Supreme Military Council from office and ordering Inner Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, AFRC. The AFRC, under the chairmanship of Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, carried out a house cleaning exercise aimed at purging the armed forces and society at large of corruption and graft as well as restoring a sense of moral responsibility and the principles of accountability and probity in public life. Meanwhile, following the program already set in motion before the 4th June uprising for civilian administration, general elections were held. On 24th September 1979, the AFRC handed over to civilian government of the People's National Party under President Hila Liman. On 31st December 1981, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings led a section of the armed forces to overthrow the PNP administration, a provisional National Defense Council composed of both civilian and military members, was established with Flight Lieutenant J.J. Rawlings as the chairman. His interests include reading, building model aircraft, horse riding and swimming. He is married to Nana Conado Ajeman Rawlings, with whom he has four children, three girls and a boy. Flight Lieutenant Rawlings ceased to be a member of the Ghana Armed Forces with effect from September 14, 1992. He formed the National Democratic Congress, which contested and won the 1992 presidential and parliamentary elections. He and the party again won the 1996 elections. His term of office ended in the year 2000. On leaving office, he was received around the world as a respected elder statesman of African politics and as recently as September of this year, went to Mali to speak to the military junta that had ousted the civilian government. In an interview this year, he admitted that even though he carries probably the most famous name in Ghanaian politics, after that of Kwame Kruma, his real name is Jerry Rawlings John. He said when he applied to join the army, they made the mistake and he did not have the nerve to correct them. The Ghana government has announced a seven days official national mourning. The press release from Ghana's presidency echoes the sentiment from around the world. It states... A great tree has fallen, and Ghana is poorer for his loss. And it ends. May his soul rest in peace in the bosom of the Almighty until the last day of resurrection, when we shall meet him again. Mahmoud Lavin, Choi QTV News. Over now to Sports News. The African Nations Cup was due to have kicked off and concluded this weekend, but it has been postponed. If you are a bit confused, well, it might be because the competition is not taking place where one might expect. The story explains more. For a 20th year, Africans were due to take to the football field to battle for the right to be crowned champions of the African Nations Cup. Not to be confused with the Africa Cup of Nations, which resumed this week. This fiercely contested tournament takes place in South Australia. Last year's competition saw 20 men's teams and 7 women's teams compete. The men's final saw Liberia defeat Sudan in the men's grand final, and in the women's grand final, Liberians women won, registering a rare double triumph for any nation. The 2018 edition had seen Liberia defeat Sudan 3-0 in the women's grand final, and Sierra Leone defeat Guinea 3-0 in the men's grand final. The African Nations Cup has featured some of Australian A-League stars, including Melbourne's victories Elvis Kamsoba and Adelaide United's Alassane Touré. Although such a competition taking place in Australia might seem strange, there are a possible half a million Africans in Australia. The 2016 Australian census listed 380,000 Africans. Although the majority of these representing the nations are amateur players, several have gone on to join the professional ranks in Australia and abroad. South Sudan is the nation that has benefited the most from players based in Australia. A recent 25-man squad for AFCON qualifiers for South Sudan featured 12 players based in Australia. The inaugural 
competition was held in 2001 and was organized by an Egyptian, Claude Malak, and featured only four nations. In 2006, the African Communities Council of South Australia, ACCSA, stepped in and hosted the tournament. However, there was no tournament in 2007. In 2013, AXA teamed up with Football Federation of South Australia to run the event. That year, 10 teams participated and South Sudan were victorious against Burundi in the grand final. This has led to the competition growing and becoming ever more competitive. Although many of the giants of African football are represented, the list of winners shows a list of teams whose nations have never won the AFCON. Among the list, only South Africa, who triumphed in this competition in 2009 and whose Bafana Bafana triumphed at AFCON in 1996, are listed. Liberia have been crowned men's champions six times. South Sudan, who previously played as Sudan, have won it four times. Other winners include Sierra Leone, twice, Uganda, Botswana, Ethiopia and Burundi, who have all won it once. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, there will be no tournament this year. However, we wish them every success for next year. Reporting for QTV News, this is Ade Darame. Well, I'm afraid that's all about it, but before we take a leave of you, here's a recap for me in headlines. President Barrow has presided over the swearing of Sidi Keita, the new Minister of Trade and Employment. The Minister of Finance on Thursday tabled before Parliament the 2021 Revenue and Expenditure Estimate after the newly elected member of Parliament for Nyamina West, Biram Sow, took his oath of office. The Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources on Thursday validated the strategic program for climate resilience to address and enable the government to apply for funding for the project. The TRRC continues to hear testimonies of victims who suffered illegal arrest, detention and torture at the hands of the now defunct NIA. In international news, the former president of Ghana, Jerry John Rawlings, has died at the age of 73 after suffering from a brief illness. In sports news, the African Nations Cup was due to have kicked off and concluded this weekend, but this competition was meant to have taken place in southern Australia. Well, that's all we have for you in this edition of the news. Do join us at 10 p.m. for another bulletin. Bye for now.